Have you ever had your identity stolen or gone through what they call identity theft? Somebody gets your credit information, tries to open up new credit in your name. Or have you ever had somebody try to ruin your name by putting out false information, that type of thing? Well, then I think you'll be able to relate to what we're going to talk about today. Don't miss it. Welcome to Follow Me, the online teaching ministry of Wayne Fleet BIC Church in Wayne Fleet, Ontario. We're in the Niagara Falls area, part of uh, Southern Niagara, and we're glad to have you uh, join us wherever you're coming from, whether you're here in the Niagara region or over in the States or someplace else in the world. Thank you for joining us at Follow Me. And This is where we look at the teachings of Jesus and we look for meaning and we look for purpose and we look for answers in life that we believe is found in who Jesus is. So thanks for being a part of this today. And we're going to kind of begin a new series of uh, talks as we look at identity theft. And you say, wow, I didn't know that you could really preach or teach about identity theft. Well, this is uh, certainly a huge problem in the Western world. Uh, Believe it or not, children identity theft is huge with school data leaks and stolen Social Security or SIN numbers here in Canada. Uh, Then there's there's all kinds of struggle, problems with what's called synthetic fraud. That's where license gets stolen or data breach involving uh, maybe address and phone numbers and people use those to create new identities. And um, it's really uh, fake info mixed in with real info. And so it's kind of synthetic. And then there's credit info problems where credit card numbers are taken or stolen. I've had that happen actually several times uh, where I've had to get new cards data breaches, dishonest uh, merchants, uh, even the little RF receivers that can swipe financial information off of our cards. But that's not really the identity theft that we're going to be looking at. This is more to do with the identity theft um, or the identity thief, I should say, who's on the loose and he targets people who follow Jesus. And uh, not only does he target followers of Jesus, but people in general. He just hates people. And, and so we're going to look at that today. This, this thief uh, certainly hates the gospel and the teachings of Jesus and hates people that want to follow Jesus. He hates people that are listening to anything about Jesus. And so uh, believers and others who maybe are trying to stick their toe back in the waters of religion and understand who Jesus is, uh, that's enough to tick off this guy. And he's an identity thief. He likes to take away from us. He likes to steal the identity of who we are as believers. And he likes to replace it with a false identity right under our noses. And so we're going to begin this conversation and talk about these things. And the thief is an actual person. Now, Some of you who are really kind of uh, sticking your toe back in the water, you may not believe that there is an actual Satan, but he is a real person. He is a created being who followed God for, we don't know how long, but a long time, and decided to rebel against God. He's an actual person. In fact, Jesus treated him as an actual person and talked about him as an actual person, We see where he even went up against Satan out in the desert and um, where Satan was trying to tempt him. And and so this is this is he's real and he is a person who hates God. He hates you and me because we're made in the image of God. 
And so Satan is, is not only a presence, but he is also a person who's very well connected through the world. In other words, Satan is, is uh, he, he, he's a person who is, he can be in one place at one time. He's not like God, where God is a spirit and he's, he's present everywhere. That, that's not true of Satan. Satan is a person, but he's very well connected around the world of, uh, of, of angels who follow him. And, uh, and they seek our demise. They seek to ruin us. And, and so this is at the heart of what this series is about. So if you don't believe Satan's real or you think this is a bunch of hokey fairy tales, I would say just stick with us and listen to what we're saying about this. And so his aim, the Bible says Jesus was teaching about him in John chapter 10 in the New Testament. And he said, Satan is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's, that, that is the three aims and purposes of, uh, of the devil. Um, Satan is known as Lucifer. That was his name as an angel. He's a.k.a. Um, uh, the devil. He's a.k.a. the accuser. That's another name that he has. He, he, he has many names, a.k.a. Beelzebub. There, there's many names that he has. And so his aim is to steal uh, our identity of who Jesus thinks we are and replace it with a false identity, trying to get us to believe some false things about ourselves. And so we're going to be kind of looking at that in the next few days. In fact, as we look at it over the next few weeks, we're going to look at four different things about this. And so we, we begin with renouncing a lie and we also replace it with a truth about Jesus. And so, for instance, this week, I renounced a lie that I'm not enough, insignificant and inadequate. I embrace the truth that I am enough because of Jesus. The second week we're going to look at, I renounce the lie that I'm abandoned and alone. And I embrace the truth that I am in Christ and he will never leave me or forsake me. The third week we're going to look at, I renounce the lie that my faith is passive and meaningless. I embrace the truth that we are co-workers with Jesus. And then the fourth one, I renounce the lie that I need to fit in with the world. I embrace the truth that I've been set apart to follow Jesus and to be his hands and his feet. So our identity of who we are and who we follow is found in, in Jesus with direction and with guidance um, I, from his teachings. I, I think that we can reclaim who Jesus wants us to know about ourselves and believe about ourselves and to believe about him. Um, so we begin with, I renounce the lie that I'm not enough, insignic insignificant and inadequate, and I embrace the truth that I am enough because of Jesus. So to, to adequ adequately rediscover our identity, we have to understand what happens when we when a person gives their life to Jesus Christ, when we become born again, when we become followers of Jesus, what happens? And so we see this in the book of Romans in the New Testament, written by an early church leader by the name of Paul, St. Paul. Maybe some of you have heard him that way. And so he says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says a few verses later in verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba in the Aramaic, it, it, uh, the Greek, it means literally daddy. It's a very personal idea of, of God being our, our daddy, our father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God 
and fellow heirs with Jesus. Now, what, what is so important about this passage and how does it apply to identity theft of who we are when we belong to Jesus? What's it mean as we kind of be, as we, as we begin this journey and looking at these things? First of all, this thief who has come to steal and to kill and to destroy, that's what Jesus taught about him in John 10, uh, this Satan, he's, he is the father of lies. I mean, there's just nothing about him that's true. And, and uh, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. And so we, we have to come back to the fact that Jesus is where we find truth. And we understand the exciting news there in Romans chapter 8 that, hey, there's no condemnation when, when we're followers of Jesus. It doesn't mean that, that God likes everything we do. It doesn't mean that he, that he maybe doesn't try to teach us or convict us about something that he would rather we not do. He would rather we flourish, and when we're not flourishing, he, he wants to help us see that. But there is no condemnation. That is, there, there is there's nothing about God that he, that he hangs over us with a two-by-four ready to let us have it. There's no condemnation with God. There, there, there's nothing that has him sitting there with a baseball bat just waiting for us to step out of line. Maybe you've been taught that version of that somebody has thought God is that type of person. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's, that's not what the early church taught about him. And that's not what we believe today. We believe he is our Heavenly Father. We believe he's our Abba father, our, our, our daddy father. And uh, in fact, we've been given a trust. Uh, we've been given this down payment for all that the heavenly father wants to give us, all that he wants us to have. Uh, he, he's come to dwell in us. He is the down payment. Uh, in other words, I'm not in heaven yet. I, <laughs> I, I'm still here on earth. But when I gave my life to Christ as a 15-year-old teenager, um, at that moment, God gave a bit of himself to us, kind of as a trust, as a earnest, as a down payment, uh, to let us know that this is real. It, heaven is real. <coughs> Excuse me, my presence is real. He said, it's so real that I'm going to give you my spirit to live inside of you and to guide you, to encourage you, to teach you, to walk with you so that you're not alone. I'm always with you and I'll never forsake you. That is what happens when a person comes to know God. We, we have this down payment of his presence and, and it, is, it is just a little bit of what we're going to have one day with him in person in this place called heaven with him. And, and so um, he gives us what we need to know him. He gives us what we need to be able to follow him and his teachings, to be able to work in the family biz, which would be the, the kingdom of God. And, and so we, we find this beautiful, beautiful story of who Jesus is and what he imparts to us because it helps form our identity of who we are as followers of Jesus. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians, which is a book in the New Testament, in chapter 1, it is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He's commissioned us. He has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything that he's promised us. That's what the scripture says just now. Uh, there's another uh, scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, again in the New Testament. And now you Gentiles, that's anybody who's not Jewish, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he'll give us our inheritance, 
that he's promised and that he's purchased us to be his own people. And he did this so that we would praise and glorify him. So as a follower of Jesus, God has, has bought us, if you will. Uh, he, he's paid off a terrible sin debt that we couldn't pay. He's, he's brought us up as adopted kids. He loves us as much as he loves his son, Jesus, the heavenly father loves us and he cares about us. The heavenly father loves you so much. Man, if you don't get anything out of this series of teachings, I want you to know that God loves you. You. That we are loved by him, that it is a crazy love, that, that he'll never not love us. There's nothing you and I can do that would cause God to cease to love us. By the way, there's nothing that you and I need to do to make God love us more. No, he already is there. He loves us with this divine love that only he could give. And so Satan tries to steal that knowledge away from us. He tries to steal away from us this identity that we're adopted into his family. He wants us to think we're on our own. He wants us to think that that this is just a religious thing that you do on Sunday. He doesn't want us to know of this great identity of who we are and that every day God is in us and lives in us and lives through us and that we're his hands and his feet in this earth as we do his work. So Satan tries to steal our identity by lying to us. Jesus taught this about Satan. He said in John chapter 8, He's always hated the truth, Satan. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, when you you hear words from other people, or you even think them in your heart, and you hear stuff like, you're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You're not good enough. Um, Look what you've done. Look where you have been. You know, you're, you don't deserve respect. You know, you don't matter. You don't matter. You're a loser. When we receive those from other people you and i need to understand those are lies that is absolutely not true in your case in my case we are none of those things even if somebody really believes that down to the core of their being doesn't matter because god has said to us you are not those things you know though those are lies that that Satan's trying to remove from you what I say you are, and he's trying to put a false identity. And he's, he's trying to get you to believe you are a loser or that the shame that you bear is, a, is just too great a load or that you're not enough in any area of life. See, he, Satan wants you to believe that, but that's not God talking. Those are lies that come our way. Because God wants to remind us of how much he loves us and cares about us. The hopes that he has for us, the plans that he has for us, they're magnificent. They're powerful. They're divine. There's there's another way that Satan tries to steal from us. Not not only just lying to us, but he's the ultimate con man. He tries to deceive us our feelings. He, he likes to deceive us. He wants us to live with these negative feelings, like I'm useless. No one, no one loves me. I'm a nobody. I'm a failure, an abject failure. I live in shame. I live in shame of not having enough, not being enough, not doing enough, not, not looking like people expect. I'm just not enough. 
the anxiety feelings of no hope, the self-loathing, the negative thoughts of even self-harm, of cutting our bodies, or, or even of suicide. Those, those are absolute, um, those are deception feelings that are being placed in us or being hurled at us by others. That, that is not how God feels about us. I, I, I would say just because you think something doesn't mean it's true. And conversely, just because someone else treats us that way doesn't mean that it's, that it's true either. And, and in fact, when someone hurls those kind of, of things at us or treats us that way, many times they're just projecting on us what, what they feel about themselves or what others have said to them. I, I think it's important for us to understand that our mind is this, is this huge battlefield that Satan, if, if he wins our mind, then he's going to win our bodies. Because every action that we take in life, it begins up here as a thought. It doesn't just happen. You know, the, the Bible says in, in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, again written by this guy named Paul, for the weapons of our warfare, this is, this is a mental, spiritual warfare. They're not of the flesh but they have divine power to destroy these strongholds, these strongholds of negativity, these strongholds of addiction, these strongholds that, that, um, of self-loathing or these, the, the strongholds of wanting to harm ourselves. These are strongholds that sometimes our brain gets into this rut and mind of thinking on these things. And God says, oh, don't be the victim of a con. Satan's trying to con you into believing that. That is not how I feel about you. That is not what I think about you. Those are not thoughts coming from me. That's what God wants us to know. You know, he says, hey, I'm telling you, in Christ, there is no condemnation coming from me to you. There's no condemnation. I don't condemn you. I want to lift you up. I want you to flourish. I want you to be all that you can be. And we belong to Jesus. If we've given our lives to him, this this power, this life-giving spirit has freed us from these kind of thoughts. We don't have to think these things. We don't have to believe these things about us. That the spiritual battle going on is that, that Satan is trying to con us into not believing what God says we are and who we are. Rather, to believe the con of these lies and deceptions that he's throwing our way. If you have thoughts along the lines of what we've talked about today, can I tell you, those aren't from God. And I I just want to encourage you today that God holds the truth about you. When he says there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ, he means that. And uh, I just wrote down a few of the thoughts today, but here's what God says about us. God thinks of us as his children. We see that in John chapter 1. We see in John chapter 15, Jesus taught that his followers are, he thinks of them as friends. You know, they're they're not just somebody to tell what to do. They're somebody to do life with. They're somebody to do the work of God's kingdom with, that God thinks of us as friends. The, The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that we've been redeemed or we've been bought with this price of Jesus giving his life for us. And, and, uh, and that we belong to the Lord. We don't belong to the devil. We don't belong to the world of these evil thoughts and these negative thoughts. We belong to God who loves us and wants us to flourish in our life and wants us to, to learn to follow him and love him and trust him. 
He, he talks about in Ephesians 1 that we've been adopted into his family. And maybe some of you who are watching have been adopted. And maybe you realize that your adopted mom and dad, they love you as much as they love their kids who maybe were, were born into the family. And, and that's how God feels about us. His only begotten son, Jesus, he loves him, but he also loves us. We've come into his family. He is our Abba Father. The book of Colossians talks about we are forgiven. All the things that you blame on yourself, all the things that you relive over and over, all the shame that you maybe when nobody else is around, but you just sink into that. Can I tell you today, you are forgiven. You have been forgiven by God. He says in Psalm 103 that as far as the east is from the west is how far he's removed our, our transgressions, our shame, our wrong, our sin, our, our poor choices, all of that. He's removed those from us. And, and then he says in Colossians, I'm complete in Jesus. In other words, Jesus brings meaning. He brings purpose. He brings love into our lives. He, he brings this, this uh, ability to be able to see life that it's bigger than us and that we're in the family biz. We get to be his hands and his feet. We get to represent him on this earth in loving others, love wins, that we get to be his agents, we get to be his, we get to be his representatives. We get to do that. Religion doesn't do that. But being a part of God's kingdom, when we give our life to him, when we give our faith to him, that is what happens. And so, as we talked about earlier in this uh, particular teaching, I think it's important for us to brace again. I renounce the lie that I'm not enough, insignificant, and inadequate. I embrace the truth that I am enough because of Jesus. So I want you to say it with me. It's going to be over my shoulder. I want you to say it with me. Ready? Right where you are. If you're in the car or you're out walking or your lunch hour and you're listening to this, wherever. Um, look at the screen and join me here. Let's say it together. Ready? I renounce the lie that I'm not enough, insignificant, and inadequate. I embrace the truth that I am enough because of Jesus. Man, I'd, I'd love to talk to you some more about this. If this really hits a chord and maybe you'd like to know more about Jesus, maybe you'd like to know more about what it means as a believer to be able to walk in this truth, in this flourishing, and not to give in to the lies or the deception that Satan tries to steal this identity that we have in Jesus. And he tries to replace it with this false identity of, of hopelessness. Man, we'd like to sit down and talk to you. My email, pat at waynefleetbic.com. Pat at waynefleetbic.com. Let's begin a conversation. And if you're wanting, tempted to, desiring to hurt yourself or even suicide, man, I just urge you to reach out. Let us help. Before you do that, that's a permanent decision to commit suicide. When that happens, it's a permanent decision. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's think about it. Let, let us help. We desire to do that. You just find yourself believing the lies that Satan wants you to, then let us help. We can walk through this with you. Pat at WayneFleetBIC.com. Well, until next week, I, I want to encourage you that um, you are much, that you are important to God. You're so important that he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. And he's made you in his image. 
and that God has a purpose for your life and that God has a purpose and plan that's bigger than ourselves and that he's called us into the family biz. He's adopted us into his family and that we get to be his hands and his feet and we get to do it together. Well, until next time, we'll see you 